the EM controversies. Yes, this is the, we are clinically mastering this one slide. Okay. <laughs> this is the blue side. If you're a clinical monster, this is the slide you choose. All right. Um, so uh, for the EM Controversies lecture today, uh, we will be talking about topical anesthetics uh, the, and basically the realm of like tetracaine um, for corneal operations. I'm going to convince you that you should be using these because pain is bad. And uh, David is going to convince you that you shouldn't be using it because we should listen to ophthalmologists. Okay. So as I said, the question today is to tetracaine or not to tetracaine. And I do apologize, I'm not used to standing in one place while giving lectures. So um, why is this even an issue that we're talking about? It's kind of hard to get uh, good data on how many uh, corneal abrasions, corneal injuries come into the ED in a given year, mostly because they're pulling this data from what we say as the chief complaint on the back end of uh, EMRs like EPIC. And sometimes we don't listen to the corneal abrasion, we simply put eye injuries. Um, however, uh, in 2008, the Healthcare Cost and Utilization Project, which is actually uh, a booklet that is produced every couple of years by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, which is from the US government, uh, basically put out that there are, um, there are uh, over half a million visits per year for eye-related injuries. Of that, uh, almost 50% of those injuries have to do with the cornea, corneal abrasions, superficial injuries to the cornea, basically. What these patients are coming to the ED for, yes, some of, a lot of these injuries are workplace injuries, um, but a lot of it has to do with pain and discomfort. So uh, let's talk about what is a uh, corneal abrasion. So a corneal abrasion results from the cutting, scratching, or abrading of the thin protective coat uh, of the anterior portion of the ocular epithelium, the outside of your eye. Um, unfortunately, there are uh, there's a lot of uh, nerve innervations to this area, so even very small superficial corneal abrasions are very uncomfortable. Um, patients typically present complaining of uh, severe pain, tearing, photophobia, a uh, constant uh, foreign body sensation or a gritting feeling, uh, gritty feeling within the eye. Um, due to the photophobia, these symptoms are typically worsened during the day with any form of exposure to light. Um, they can actually make the symptoms much worse because that chronic kind of gritty feeling leaves them rubbing and scratching at their eye, trying to remove this foreign body that they can feel, and they can actually create uh, more damage to the cornea. So they come into the ED and they are complaining of a lot of pain, right? Um, so these are the patients when they come in, uh, sometimes they will come in with the eye covered, sometimes they'll just come in saying that I was at my job site, I was at home, something happened, I was wearing my contacts and I was pulling out my contacts and my nails are too long, anything like that. Um, very often with these injuries, they do present, present either at the time of the injury or within hours of the injury taking place. And that is because of the consistent pain that they're feeling. So the good thing about corneal injuries, if there is a good part, is that they do heal very rapidly. Usually within 72 hours or so, the pain is reduced dramatically. Um, definitely within the course of about a week, they'll start to feel just like, just like themselves. Um, but as I said, there's a lot of innervation to that area of the eye. So they are in a lot of pain and a lot of discomfort. So sometimes when they do come in, the the thought is, oh, well, it's not that dangerous. Your vision is intact. You're doing okay. I'm going to give you some Tylenol. I'm going to send you home. They do tend to represent to the ED because they're like, I'm still in pain. I can't sleep. I can't function like this. So what are our pain management options? So basically going through this list, you have uh, oral pain management, right? You can give them some Tylenol, some naproxen, whatever your end set of choice is. 
historically, they did talk about uh, cycloplegics um, because the thought was that part of the reason why the photophobia uh, caused so much pain was basically the movement of the muscles. So if you paralyze the muscles, you wouldn't have as much pain. Uh, you have topical NSAIDs, so we're actually going to talk about that a little bit, which are basically eye drops, not the brain. Um, oral opiates, some people very often do get prescribed Percocets, things like that for the pain because it is that uh, problematic. And uh, our little friend, tetracaine. So going through some of this list, sometimes not with our patient population, but the adage remains that if they could manage the pain at home, they probably wouldn't be in the emergency department. So you can give them the Tylenol and the Motrin and they may have some reduction in pain, but they're still to the point where they're not comfortable, they're not able to go home, they don't want to be discharged like that. Uh, the cycloplegics, they've had um, multiple studies. Uh, the last one that I, one of the ones that I have here, uh, they had one in 2013 and one in 2017. And basically the evidence behind the practice is very sparse and it really doesn't support widespread use. A study of 40 patients who were randomized to receive either uh, basically a cycloplegic versus a placebo in 2017, found no difference in pain scores. Another study of 401 patients randomized to receive basically just lubrication, so just the equivalent of Visine um, versus a cycloplegic um, versus a, a, a topical NSAID, uh, basically showed that there was no difference between the cycloplegic and the topical Visine. So it's really not doing much. It's not helping the patients. The theory behind it is solid, but it's not really creating that pain relief that we'd like. Okay, um, and going through the opiates, we are in the midst of an opiate epidemic. I suppose at this point we can call it a pandemic just like COVID. Um, and there have been studies to show that even when people come into the ED, you aren't sure which opiate pill will be the one that creates that addiction. So as much as possible, unless it is absolutely necessary, we do try to avoid prescribing opiates. So we get to our uh, two, the two ones that we have of concern. So we have topical NSAIDs. Most of us have probably never even heard of the topical NSAIDs. Um, and that's because in the year 2000, that was like the hot thing to do. We started prescribing topical NSAIDs and the media described it as the patient's cornea started melting, which as you can probably imagine is not a good thing. <laughs> so basically there were about 200 cases of corneal melting, which is they had severe damage and retreat of the corneal epithelial cells. Um, it was described by about 106 physicians, and it was associated with a generic form of topical ketorolac. Now, the, the generic form was pulled from the market, obviously, and it's no longer used, but nobody could really come up with a great answer as to why the generic caused it, and the non-generic version still had cases reported but caused it much less, so it has kind of fallen out to the wayside. There have been several smaller studies that have popped up um, over the past 10 years, more or less saying that perhaps it was just something native to this drug in particular, and this is something that we should be reevaluating. But it's kind of hard to sell it to a patient where we're going to give you this medication. It's either going to make you feel better or your cornea will melt. Either way. <laughs> so now um, we get to my friend Tetracaine. Now, very often we're told not to prescribe tetracaine because it causes some issues, but it's not quite cornea mounting, right? So the downsides of the tetracaine, the concern that we typically, the concern that typically exists is that we'll give people tetracaine and they won't be able to tell us whether or not um, their, their symptoms are worsening, their symptoms are improving, and they can actually do more damage to their eyes. But David is going to talk to you about all of that. And before I give you his argument, let's talk about the facts. Is it effective, right? So there's been a lot, an actual in, recent increase of studies of people actually looking at whether or not tetracaine is effective for pain relief, because that's what we're aiming for. As we said, for most corneal abrasions, their vision remains intact. They don't have any serious consequences down the line. So what we're trying to do is get pain relief. So... 
Um, for this paper in particular, uh, they got 111 patients that were included in the final analysis. Um, it's just about split even. You have 56 in the tetracaine group and 55 in the placebo group. Now, there are a couple of issues, in my opinion, with how they actually uh, looked at how this worked. Um, one of the things that kind of pops up when you look through the paper is that tetracaine works almost immediately. You have pain relief within minutes of applying it, but they were kind of looking at it about at a 24 or 48 hour follow up in addition to the immediate time point. So now the numeric scale rating of pain um, for this study was significantly lower in the tetracaine group um, versus the placebo group. The pain scale that they used was basically the one that we like to use in the ED, one to 10. Uh, the tetracaine group on average was about one. The placebo group was about eight. So this study is basically showing that um, the tetracaine was helpful in reducing their pain. There are some confounders with this study, however, because all of the patients that got tetracaine and who didn't get tetracaine uh, were also given oxycodone. So one of the things that they looked at in addition to the fact that yes, these patients were also on the oxycodone was, what, was how much they were using. And the group that was receiving the tetracaine was using less opiates than the group that didn't. Now, getting back to the concern of, well, if we give these patients tetracaine and they can't feel their eyes, how will they know if it's getting worse? And the data just doesn't bear that out. It is a concern that, of course, exists and we should think about with our patients. But in both, of, in both groups, the uh, complication rate was about the same, basically minimal. Um, most of the issues that they ran into were issues that probably should have been found in the initial visit. Either there was a retained foreign body that wasn't noticed or the, the abrasion was more serious than they had thought. All right. So this is the endpoint that we were talking about with the pain scores. Um, so let's talk about the limitations, right? There were a lot of uh, exclusion criteria for this study. So if you were somebody that used contact lenses, they basically said you were excluded. It was unclear whether or not if you use contact lenses in general, you were excluded, or if they basically gave them the option of being like, hey, you can get this drug, but you can't use your contact lenses over the next couple of days. So in general, however, if you have corneal abrasion, they're probably telling them you shouldn't be putting your contact lenses over it. So I don't think that was a phrase exclusion criteria. Um, anybody that had a previous corneal transplant was excluded. That's in general, a pretty small number of patients. And anyone who presented uh, 36 hours or greater after the initial insult to the eye. I think that's an okay exclusion criteria, mostly because the pain typically resolves within 72 hours and it does start to improve within about 24 hours. So people who are presenting a little bit later and are still in significant amount of pain, you should probably do a very careful exam to make sure that you're not missing anything. Um, and there's an argument for me that they have made it this far, the pain is going to resolve within 24 hours. Uh, they didn't really need to be uh, treated. Now, in terms of the safety considerations and the um, number of Complications, the study was underpowered. It's only 111 patients. They did lose people to follow up. So complications that are much more rare, you're not gonna catch with this small group. Um, and in general, something that you will find with these studies across the board is that there are very little head-to-head -head comparisons within with topical tetracaine and topical NSAIDs. So they're looking at basically oxy and tetracaine versus oxy and nothing. <laughs> All right, so the biggest question, right? Is it safe? Once again, the studies overall are pretty small. They're just starting to kind of look back at it over the last like five years or so. Um, however, OPTO is actually, to an extent, their studies are in our corner as well. So they are a number of proposed dangers that limit the use of the topical, um, the topical anesthetic. So the concern is delayed healing secondary to mitosis inhibition and decreased corneal sensation. These have been shown in some very small animal studies. It's never been shown in vivo. Um, most of the literature condemning the use of topical anesthetics for treatment of the eye are from basically like the 60s and the 50s. 
There are a couple cases of the, in the 70s and the 80s where people had um, corneal breakdown with use of tetracaine, but this, these were cases where the patients were given the tetracaine, sometimes by a provider, sometimes by not, but there was no follow-up. So in almost, I think in all of the um, case reports that are usually mentioned, people were using it like every hour on the hour for months, five, six months, which is not what we are instructing people to do. We're instructing them to use it for about three days. And once it's over, there's, they should follow up and they should get seen. So um, in addition, um, there is, uh, don't ask me to pronounce it, there is photoreductive keratectomies. It's called PRK for short. It's basically uh, similar to LASIK, uh, LASIK surgery. And there has been an, an increase in ophthalmologists prescribing tetracaine um, for anesthesia after this surgery. They're doing it because they're, rec they're recognizing that it is working for their patients. They're not having this fake breakdown because these are patients that are actually having surgery done mm -hmm. and they're still okay using it. So of these studies that are um, basically put up here, there's a 1995 study where they did the PRK that said there was no delay in healing and uh, there was no adverse effects. Um, 1997 basically said the same thing, no delay in healing, and there was a very large pain improvement. Um, and then there's the Walnut study. This is the this is the best like recent ED study uh, looking at tetracaine versus placebo. There was no statistically significant difference in the pain scores, but there was no difference in healing. Now, I do want to point out that while Dave is going to say there was no difference in pain scores in this paper, and this is the paper that we're talking about with safety, the goal of this paper was not looking at pain reduction. It was looking at safety. Now, because of that, the the... The pain score that they used, even me looking through it as a physician, it was kind of confusing. Um, they did have a significant loss of follow-up. Um, but because the study was primarily looking at corneal healing, even patients that did not hand in the, the pain score, because it was basically a, a, a little sheet that they had to fill out, meaning they had no data on pain, they still included them in the study because they were looking at safety, they weren't looking at pain reduction. Because we do have all of these other studies. Um, looking at pain reduction. So now going back to the basically the general problem of all of these studies uh, is the number of patients. So this is over a five-year period, even the opto, opto paper basically that was looking at pain reduction and safety after PRK, it's a very small number of patients that we do have. Okay. So coming back to our initial questions, why bother? Why are we even having this conversation? So the American Academy of Emergency Medicine says that effective, efficient, and safe pain management is a cornerstone of a state-of-the-art patient care in the emergency department and is a specialty defining skill. These patients are presenting to the ED because they are in pain and they want you to help them treat their pain in a manner that is both safe and effective, preferably one with the fewest uh, the, the fewest after effects. Uh, my argument is that while the topical NSAIDs have actually had these like terrible outcomes with appropriate use, we have not seen those issues with tetracaine. The PO medications that we are more comfortable prescribing, the Tylenol and Motrin don't work as well. And I don't think we should be sending these patients home with a five or six day supply of oxycodone. Um, so takeaway points, uh, corneal abrasions are one of the most common eye-related complaints in the ED. We have all seen several of them. They are painful. Uh, tetracaine is effective, and most of the concerns for side effects have to do with theoretical risks or risks that were shown with inappropriate use of the medication. You should treat your patient's pain. <laughs> <laughs> Um, good morning. Um, I'm David. I'm going to take this off. So thank you very much, Char, for that um, very informative talk. I'll be quite honest that after reviewing the data, I'm not really sure myself if 
tetracaine is a good idea or if it's not. And so the purpose of my section isn't necessarily to convince you that we shouldn't be giving tetracaine. It's just that before you make that decision for yourself, you really have to know how to go through the data and know its limitations. So my question for you now and at the end of this is, is tetracaine really the best idea? So Shar already went through some of this, so I don't have to kind of beat a dead horse, I guess, but we do have a lot of other options. Um, we obviously said that the oral medications will have like systemic side effects and you don't want to necessarily wind up prescribing opioid medications for somebody that's going to wind up hooked on them. Um, we do have topical NSAIDs, which Shar also mentioned some of the controversy there. Um, I think one thing that it's important to remember is that most of these abrasions, even if you do absolutely nothing, chances are it's going to be gone by like two days or at least significantly improved to the point that the patient can tolerate it and function. And so that's not to say that we shouldn't bother treating the pain. It's just to remember that you should be doing something that's safe and proven to work, not something that you're not sure might help that has potential risks. So Char, again, already went through a little bit of this, but these are just some of the randomized controlled trials that have actually happened since those case reports. Um, it was like 20 or 25 years ago and somebody's cornea started melting after the topical NSAID, which is now off the market. Um, and actually all of these studies now prove that topical NSAIDs do reduce pain and foreign body sensation and actually the need for rescue oral medication. So it's just something to keep in mind. Again, I'm not sure if I would prescribe them because I'm not going through all of that data today, but I want to talk more about tetracaine. So two things before we get into the data. So the first is that the purpose of the pain is to tell the patient that something is wrong, right? And so if you give tetracaine and the pain goes away, because it might work, maybe, um, they won't know if they're getting worse. And so that's actually really, really dangerous. Patients can develop keratitis or like an ulceration and not really realize it. And then if we know at baseline that only like 20% of patients go to their appointments, which we'll see in a later study, if you know that, that only one in five patients are actually going to go see the ophthalmologist, then I'm not sure that it's the best idea even for two days to give this medication because the patient may not know. And that's not to put any blame on the patient or the system. It's just something to keep in mind that you have to understand that the patient may or may not go to their appointment. And then there is some thought that actually pain in the cornea is an evolutionary response that promotes healing. So if you get rid of it, it would actually may delay healing. That is kind of actually disproven. Um, again, I'm kind of arguing both for and against tetracaine today. Um, but they think basically that pain goes through the trigeminal nerve and actually upregulates growth factors to expedite the healing of the corneal epithelium. So this is um, from... Um, I think it's from Annals of Emergency Medicine. It's a letter to the editor from 2019. Basically, a group of ophthalmologists wrote this letter to the editor expressing grave concern, quote unquote, about the trend towards using topical tetracaine from the emergency department. And so basically they did a survey of 75 cornea trained ophthalmology specialists and asked them if they want us to give tetracaine. And the answer is no. Um, Nobody, pretty much one person. So that's, I would take that with a grain of salt just because it's expert opinion doesn't necessarily mean that tetracaine is a bad drug. It's just really important to understand the data behind it before you make your own decision. And so the other thing too, is that if you're a cornea trained ophthalmologist, chances are the patients that you're actually seeing in your clinic are the worst of the worst, right? They're the ones who have the complications and the ones who are the most difficult to treat. And so they have a spectrum bias. So I think that probably influences the results of these. And this was also before one of the randomized controlled trials that Shar talked about. So let's actually get into some of the data. So this is from 2021, this is you et al., which is a systematic review in academic emergency medicine. 
basically they're going over all these different kinds of ways that you can give topical pain control for corneal abrasions. But if you actually look at the breakdown of studies, there's only like three that talk about topical tetracaine. And so that's not really enough to go one way or the other um, in terms of their effectiveness. So they actually come to the conclusion that there's insufficient data really to go for or against the use of topical tetracaine. There's a couple studies within the systematic review that identify an improvement after one or two days. And then Waldman, which I'll talk about later, has no difference at two days. And that's pretty much it. However, this part is of interest, particularly for Shar's argument, actually. So this is from the systematic review comparing tetracaine to placebo for both the um, likelihood of healing and for the rate of complications. And so you can see because all of those dots cross the midline, that means your confidence interval is crossing one. So there's no significant difference if you use tetracaine or if you use placebo. So that actually kind of argues to me in favor of tetracaine because it's not affecting healing and it's not giving people complications. So why not try it if it might work? However, it's just important to remember that there's only three or four studies that actually studied tetracaine. And because of the heterogeneity in the evidence, it's very, very low certainty in the systematic review. So I don't know that it's enough to, um, to push us one way or the other. And because there's so few patients, it doesn't tell us about adverse events. Okay, then Waldman et al. This is from Academic Emergency Medicine in 2014. This one is a randomized controlled trial. It's prospective, um, basically giving um, 116 patients either tetracaine or saline drops. Um, and then they, the outcome, the primary outcome was actually healing at 48 hours, like Shara said, but then secondarily, they studied pain scales. Um, so there's a couple of issues. Essentially, they found no difference in healing, and then they reported also no difference in the pain scales. But there's a couple of major issues with this study. So there was very extensive exclusion criteria, which are listed in that table. A couple that I really want to highlight for you are the fact that if they had a foreign body, they were excluded. If they had a large or complicated abrasion, they were excluded. Or if they were unable to follow up within 48 hours. So to be honest, from Kings County, I'm not sure that we're going to ever have that be a possibility. Even in other places, I don't know if two-day ophthalmology follow-up is feasible for a lot of patients. Um, and even the patients that were included in the study, only like 20% of them actually went. Um, the other one, large or complicated corneal abrasions, that's a little bit confusing to me because I think it's pretty subjective. Um, and if it's a really, really large corneal abrasion, I don't know, does it require maybe an ophthalmology evaluation as well? Because I don't remember, you know, I don't know if all of us do a slip lamp exam for every single one of these patients, even though we should be. Um, the other thing, the use of the pain scales as a secondary outcome, maybe it's not the most reliable um, measurement actually of effectiveness for pain. And last but not least is blinding, no pun intended. But if you're giving tetracaine, there's no way that somebody's not going to realize they're getting tetracaine because it burns. And so if you give tetracaine, the patient gets burning and they're like, ow, my eye, both the patient and the physician know then that the patient was given tetracaine. So I don't think it was a blind study. So this is from the follow-up section of the same article. And by the way, I will send out all of these articles today. So if you want to take a look at them yourself, you can. Um, but essentially, you see in the follow-up section here that 39 out of 61 patients in the saline group actually returned for their two-day ophthalmology appointment. So that's like 33% that just didn't go. Same thing for the other group. That's a large number when it's such a small number of patients. And then you see also that they have such variable follow-up. They have questionnaires. They have contact by phone at one week and one month, all with different numbers. And so I think it's very heterogeneous and not necessarily the best data to, to rely on. Um, and then at the bottom, under the analysis section, you see actually they excluded 10 patients and 13 patients because of retained restrings at their follow-up. 
So to me, that's either telling me that, the, that they didn't do a complete evaluation at the beginning to find a foreign body or that they probably should have been excluded in the first place. And it's technically not really an intention to treat analysis. So this is the results. Um, it's a little bit difficult to interpret, but essentially all of these bars overlap. So that's telling you that there's no significant difference in terms of the scale of pain scores. Um, patients did kind of rate the tetracaine to be more effective, but that doesn't really tell you if it works. Okay, last one is Shipman from 2021. This was this month actually in Annals of Emergency Medicine. Um, Char kind of told you the basics of the study, but I just wanted to highlight one more time the exclusion criteria. So some of these were already mentioned, including a foreign body or contact lenses, but these are also really important to mention. This is in the next sentence. Um, they excluded patients who couldn't go to follow-up. They excluded patients who had any injury that requires an urgent ophthalmology evaluation, which is so subjective to me, it's crazy. And large or complicated abrasions, same thing. I don't know particularly how to grade an abrasion just from looking at like the percentage. Um, this is a little bit hard to see. Oops, I don't know why that didn't go. There we go. Um, so this is a little bit hard to see, but this is a table basically at follow-up listing the complications that patients had. And you can see a couple of them. One had like a foreign body, a couple had some iritis that wasn't diagnosed or uveitis and so. To me, that's telling me that there was not a complete initial evaluation, including a slip lamp exam, because chances are you would have seen the foreign body. Um, again, blinding is hard because tetracaine burns, but also because in this study, the tetracaine came in a different package from the saline. So I don't think that that's really a blind study. Um, and then just for the results, um, this is a little bit difficult to interpret. And so, I, I really do think you should look at the studies yourselves, but only 20% in the tetracaine group and 18% in the placebo group actually went to their follow-up appointments. So that's of the patients who were even included in the study in the first place, even though not going is an exclusion criteria. Um, and then for the rest of them, they just like called or texted them and asked how they were doing. So that's kind of insane that out of a group of like 60 patients in each group, if 20% go, that's like, what, 12 patients? That's nothing to base your entire conclusion on. So I don't think that this is a reliable study to at least base clinical practice. Um, I will note here though, that the numbers for the follow-up are actually quite similar. So it's telling you probably that tetracaine itself isn't preventing people from going to their follow-up appointment which I guess is important to remember, but still that's such a low number that I would be wary of doing that. And then again, just the fact that they measure pain scores at two days, the abrasion might be gone or significantly better without any intervention by that point. And like Shar said, because it's such a low number of patients, it doesn't really tell us anything in terms of the adverse events. So just to summarize, because I know we have another person coming at 11, and I wanted to have some space for questions. I want you anytime that there's like a trend or like a new paper and everybody's really excited about it, actually look at it and make your own decision about the data because you can't just base everything off of expert opinion um, or what everybody else is doing. You should actually look because for me in Waldman and Shipman, these exclusion criteria and the small sample size and the lack of follow-up kind of not necessarily invalidate the studies for me, but really give me pause, right? I'm not going to be prescribing tetracaine for patients until there's more evidence. Um, so that's it. I definitely want you to treat pain, but you just need to be careful with the data until there's enough to push people one way or the other. So that's it. Are there questions for either of us? Because we have a little bit of time before the next lecture. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've, I've read, I don't know if I've ever read these studies, but I remember reading one specifically that mentioned how much, you know how much tetracaine they actually gave these patients where they 
did they give them like a specialized bottle that was for 24 hours or did they have, they just like hand them the bottle of tetracaine? I think it was 1%. So you might have to like dilute the tetracaine that we get from the Pixis or from the pharmacy and dilute it in with saline and put it back into the bottle. I'm not exactly sure. And then for, I know for Waldman, they did it like you're allowed to inject a few drops every 30 minutes until the pain is controlled, but it's only for 24 to 48 hours. I think, I think it was Waldman that I, I think, I think so, but they had, what they gave them was a 0.5 ml bottle. They specifically had a bottle that you couldn't give, it was only 24 hours of tetracaine. So it's not like they just handed them like a 5 ml or a 10 ml bottle. They were like, there's a specifically a limited dose amount that they could get, which to, to me would be like a rate limiting. Thing. Yeah, so like that's another thing. Like I couldn't, you know, like I wouldn't want to hand somebody like two weeks worth of tetracaine and be like, don't use it that much. Yeah, you know, they actually had some way of ensuring compliance. I think that's a reasonable idea, to be honest, because I think if you, with that systematic review, that's telling you that it doesn't really change healing or complications. Maybe it's okay to just give a tiny amount. Um, still, I'm not saying studies are enough. I have something to say. Um, something that I've done before, uh, it's needy, uh, is that when we get the tetracaine to do the floor seed, I'll keep the bottle. I'll squeeze out like almost all the bottles. You can, it's kind of clear. You can see how much is left and then just give the patient like a little bit of it and tell them they can use it for like the next day until they follow up. Everybody heard that? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Needy. I would be curious if any of our attendings here do this, or if you give topical NSAIDs. I'll come. I mean, I usually don't. I usually give systemic NSAIDs. Um, I guess, I think what you, I, I've used it myself. I guess you could say that. I've given myself tetracaine with the, with the high issue. Uh, it's very, it works well, but it's very self-limited. Um, I think the big thing I take away from this presentation is that you can't always trust expert uh, opinion, but when there's not enough evidence, that is what you're left with. And you shouldn't practice based on malpractice, but let's say there is a complication and there's malpractice, that's all you're left with in, in terms of what they're gonna present you in terms of the standard of care is, is uh, expert opinion. Uh, and I think being informed about the, the data and what's, what's written is really important, but then also bring your patient to that. Tell, tell them that too, you should tell them that, hey, there's a chance for complications. This is not an evidence-based um, intervention, and uh, it can help, but it, uh, it, it could be uh, malpractice. I would probably use it and, use, and uh, have something that I would potentially give as a second or third line. Let's say a patient bounces back and has a really bad abrasion and is having really difficult pain control. I don't know if everybody heard that, but Dr. Willis said that um, basically if there's not enough evidence, you might be left with expert opinion as your thing to fall back on, even though that, you know, bias potentially, and that he may use tetracaine as like a second line agent if somebody came back to the emergency um, with a coronary patient. I guess that's it drops for patients who have PUD who have bad ulcer disease and I don't want to give them any agents for their stomach. And I don't use tetracaine. Only to examine them. Shameless blood flow so that. Why do you use the uh, topical NSAIDs versus the stepping? What's that? Why, why do you prefer the topical um, NSAIDs versus the... Uh, Less chance of getting gastric erosion and some stomach problems. No, uh, versus tetracaine. Oh, I think tetracaine is more destructive than that. It's a, that's just personal, famous, not based on any left. Dr. Uh, yeah, David, so, so, that was great. Sharon, David, thank you so much. So it's very good. It steps away. It's controversial. Kind of um, but I've never used topical NSAIDs, but something that's a little bit more comforting. When somebody's eyes closed, it clearly feels better. When I get these people, especially if it's at night, they know they're going to go home and go to bed, it makes it a little bit more comforting. Because when they wake up, it's all, you, almost, you know, uh, a non-issue. I would also be worried about giving somebody too much tetracyclin. Mm -hmm. Ravi? Yeah, I guess, like, think about, like, I think similar to like when we used to like not give like more for people with abdominal pain because they're concerned that like it would mask their exam. I don't think that's a good reason to not give a pain medication. Um, the other thing about like the expert opinion, like it's kind of similar to the antibiotics for ENT uh, for like um, nasal packing, just because like they recommend it doesn't mean it's evidence based. The other thing is I don't think 
you, I think you have to prove harm. I don't think you have to necessarily prove safety. So in other words, there's no evidence that, this study doesn't show that it's safe, but there's also no uh, evidence that it's harmful. I'm not saying to give it or not, but I think you need to do, a, if they're gonna say it's harmful, I think you have to demonstrate that it's harmful. But you're getting pretty short to sell the video. Yeah. Uh, that, that's my point. Yeah, right? Right. Like really, even if you're gonna send a patient home with it, minutes. it's yeah, it wears off so fast that I don't think it's really that practical either. Um, I don't really know if it's unsafe because I, there's no there's no good data saying it's really unsafe or safe in my opinion, but I just don't think it's a great a great controller of pain in the first place. Mm -hmm. And really, like you said, it, within 48 hours, it's, the pain should just be supplemented anyway. Well, I think it works really well. It's a great controller of pain, it just doesn't last for right? That's what I mean, yeah. It just how, it's, it's so, it wears off so quickly then. How long do the topical NSAIDs last? Hours, I believe. Double, double answer. Mm -hmm. I would just Rob, you're coming about the morphine. I mean, the morphine masking pain is, is for a physician's exam. I think the concern with the tetracaine masking pain is that a patient is assessing their own pain and potential worsening. Uh, I, don't, I don't equate those two. Yeah, you're not hiding the sure. technology. Like they're following up an opto, they've been using tetracaine the whole time. Opto can still look at the ulcer and say that it's not better or some issue with it. Yeah. As opposed to uh the British given each other and they can't follow up potentially. And Dr. G, did you want to say something? Yeah, I I, I don't send them home with can with lidocaine, with a tetracaine or octane or proparacaine, just because that's been the practice that we were told not to do. Again, when I've looked it up, there's not great studies on it. What I do is I give it to do my exam, and then right before they leave, I give some more. Uh, I have used topical NSAIDs, but mostly when I've used that, it's been for allergic conjunctivitis more than for uh, this. And I usually send them home for this on NSAIDs orally, unless there's a contraindication, and then I just use Tylenol. And most of them don't seem to bounce back that I've seen. I followed up. I was actually surprised that they were using opioids because I've never given yeah. opioids. Never given opioids for this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. At least not to go yeah. home. Yeah. Yeah. I've, seen, <laughs> I've seen some really bad cardiac operations though that are very painful. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I've never used them. Yeah. Yeah. Topical opioids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you.